Uh, today's webinar is brought to you from the Regulatory Services Partnership. Uh, thanks to generous funding from the European Union's Regional Development Fund. Uh, today we'll be looking at the hair, beauty and soft tissue massage sector. So, a little bit of small print at the beginning. Views expressed by any speaker are the speakers alone, don't necessarily represent the views of UK Government, European Commission or the body the speaker represents. You will hear some science on virus transmission and effectiveness of face coverings. This information is sourced from various studies internationally, will be made available and follow-up information circulated, and is merely provided to support businesses understand the context of guidance and our views you'll hear today. This is all fast moving, the science is constantly uh, being updated, uh, thus the advice on what are safety and adequate safety measures is constantly evolving as well. Whilst efforts have been made to ensure it's up to date, please recognise we are regulators, not scientists, so some aspects may not reflect the most recent scientific thinking, nor are, is it necessarily comprehensive. So do uh, think about seeking your own views, uh, legal or scientific advice where appropriate. This is based on English law, so official guidance can differ for our premises in other parts of the UK, although much of the practical guidance in the webinar will be useful to any business anywhere in the UK. Mention of or participation by any business or body during the webinar does not amount to a recommendation by the Council. We've neither vetted them nor confirmed their premises to be COVID secure. And the webinar is being recorded for the benefit of any businesses who aren't able to join us today. So this has been brought to you from the Regulatory Services Partnership. We're a council-owned service covering London boroughs of Merton, Richmond and Pond Thames and Wandsworth. You may be a business based in another area and you've been signposted to this webinar, probably from your national trade associations. Uh, even though you're based outside our area, the information you hear today uh, which should be very useful to you. We have over 50 highly trained, experienced advisors covering the range of uh, local authority services that uh, your businesses would typically come across. We have an advisory and enforcement role in respect of COVID regulations and our focus is on you know, supporting businesses to get things right, hence these webinars uh, that we're doing for various sectors. Speakers today are myself, Paul Miloszewski reed I'm a Chartered Principal Trading Standards Practitioner, I'm Maria Dane, our health and safety inspector who does our business COVID risk assessment visits. Both of us are from the RSP. We'll also be joined by industry experts, Caroline Lazare, Director of Quality and Standards at the NHFB, and Jenny Park Matheson, author of GCMT's uh, resource pack. So a little bit of an overview of what we'll be covering in the next 40 plus minutes. You'll get some of the science for context, practical steps to reducing risk at your premises. You'll hear from your trade association, their own guidance. Uh, we'll cover face coverings, visors and gloves. Uh, steps to bring customers back through the doors. Um, thoughts to how to recover the cost of the safety measures. We'll talk, touch on financial and other support. Um, safeguarding your sector from a second shutdown. And then Q&A at the end with a panel of speakers. With that in mind, please use the chat function um, for any queries you may have. So context of the virus has been lots uh, in media. Things have changed, as I say, constantly evolving. You'll have heard different things in, uh, from different places. So let's just have some context so we're all at uh, you know, the kind of level playing field. So uh, whenever we talk, breathe, cough, sneeze, uh, droplets of water are released from our mouths. These large droplets typically fall very quickly to the floor, um, but those droplets that lose their moisture, uh, some of these will um, become these fine particles, airborne particles that are suspended in the air. You will have heard the official advice from WHO for, for months has been that the virus is transmitted mainly through these large droplets when we cough and sneeze. Those droplets fall into surfaces, hence, uh, the increase in surface cleaning and also hand washing because when we touch those surfaces that have the virus we need to wash our hands rather than uh, touch our faces and uh, transmit the virus to ourselves. 
Um, this is why the advice is typically being around these physical barriers, screen barriers, face visors between customers and staff, because those catch these physical droplets that we'd, uh, we'd go one, two meters away. International scientific opinion is evolving, so now there is strong evidence to suggest the virus can spread in the air through much tiner particles that float around after we talk or breathe out. So these tiny particles called aerosols, they can actually remain suspended in the air for several hours, two days, um, and they can travel through building via air currents. So they're so uh, small, so light, that gravity doesn't drop them to the floor. So think about this in your, inside your own premises. It's not just coughing and sneezing, it's when customers are talking, when they're breathing out, these tiny aerosols are being released. The other important thing to be mindful of, most people with the infection will be unaware because 80% of those who are, have been infected display mild or don't show any symptoms at all. And of the minority, so the small number who do go on to develop symptoms, there's a high rate of transmission, so they transmit the virus to others uh, to quite an extent, up to two days before they develop symptoms, which might include a higher temperature, for example. So these people, you and I, could have the virus, and unfortunately we don't know it until we get tested. So we are working, shopping, socializing as normal. You need to think about that because when you're designing your processes, your safety measures, it's not just for those who know they've got the virus or who display obvious signs of high temperatures, coughing. It is the majority who don't display any of those signs. So obviously it's great news. Government's given permission for uh, most sectors to reopen. But having that legal permission doesn't mean to say it's safe to do so. If you open too early, there's risk to yourself, staff and customers. Um, and you obviously want to avoid the need to close down. You may be open now uh, and have concerns yourself that maybe things aren't as safe as you like. So do be very mindful of that. Listen to the advice that will come from both regulators and your industry experts to make a, a, the best decision for yourself uh, and staff. So the, these are some steps that you should consider. Move your business outdoors. You know, customer queues, seating, waiting areas, uh, find solutions with neighboring businesses. You might not have enough uh, pavement, outdoor space. Your neighbor may have forecourt. Have those discussions to see uh, what can be arranged. Obviously, as much as possible, you want to limit any waiting around, but it may not be always possible. So the best thing is to have no queues, no waiting, but where that is impossible, look to have those uh, taking place outdoors. Why? because out of 300 odd outbreaks, only one was connected to outdoor transmission. Uh, so lots of studies looking at virus carriers and where they were. Um, so this was around 7,000 uh, people that caught the virus. Uh, there was only one incident uh, with two people um, regarding outdoor transmission. The thinking is that virus aerosols typically dilute too quickly in outside air to pose a risk. So with that in mind, two options. One is get, uh, apply for the fast track pavement license. However, um, and there's a load of Q&As, uh, we'll answer all your questions around this in the follow up. That is designed for just the sale of food and drink, uh, which obviously doesn't apply to your business. Uh, and so if you want similar uh, ability to, to have pavement licenses, to put waiting areas, seating outdoors, talk to your trade association, they're in the best place to represent your views to government. The second option, second option has nothing to do with pavement licenses. Some biz, uh, councils are just making the decision uh, to widen pavement, to do you know, practical things to help businesses out. So you'll see in some um, areas around the country, uh, things like this where barriers have been put up to narrow roads, widen pavements, so all businesses in that area can get seating outdoors. There is a downside to that. Um, the police uh, do want to make everybody aware that uh, you know, the current terrorism national threat level is substantial. 
which means an attack is likely. Um, we're not, um, the latest information I had was that they weren't aware of any particular threats in our uh, three London boroughs. This is obviously constantly changing, but there are things you can do to protect your customers. Um, police recommend visual deterrence um, using street furniture. So, for example, in the H&M uh, picture to the left, you'll see everybody's queuing on the road to the right of the barriers. If the store simply recommended everybody queue to the left of those big metal barriers, that would make them a lot safer. Not every premise will have street furniture outside their uh, the door so what you can do is similar to what the pub here has done you can put plant troughs other things um, that act as a visual deterrent now you may think well that won't stop a car but this is this is sort of like burglar alarms a burglar alarm will look for the easiest target and it's exactly the same with somebody behind a car that wants to do harm they will look for whatever the easiest target is uh, to cause maximum damage so Doing these little things um, for outside your premise can make a huge difference to keep your customers safe. There's lots more advice, guidance, training on the um, counterterrorism app by the Met Police. Uh, it's called PSO London Shield. Even if you have a premise outside London, this is still going to be relevant to yourself. Steps you must take. Um, so. I've heard from businesses uh, questioning the government guidance, saying, well, it's only guidance, we don't really need to follow that, do we? Well, every business has obligations under health and safety laws. You must do a risk assessment, and then you must minimize the risks you identify to staff and customers. The government guidelines are, you know, the best advice brought together by scientists, your trade association representatives, to try and look at what are the risks in your business and given some practical advice of the ways that you can minimize it. So um, in terms of what to do, you know, what will happen if you don't follow the guidance? Well, enforcement is obviously an option, but really I would suggest that's, uh, you know, low down on the list of things you should concern yourself with. If there is an outbreak in your premise, there, that will affect your reputation. You may need to close down for a few weeks. It may um, affect uh, how customers feel about coming back. Uh, you need to be mindful of that. It may affect your public liability insurance if you did not follow the official guidance. Uh, so those are things that could you know, be significantly more expensive than uh, a fine uh, from enforcers. <clears throat> there's lots of information out there. Um, there's no bones about it. That it's, it's tough. It's tough trying to make sense of it all. This is all very new for everybody. Um, but this is a really good place to start. If you go to this web page, um, fill in, answer five, six questions about your sector, size of business, etc. You will get um, given all the relevant guides um, uh, in one place. Naturally, you'll be directed towards the government guide or guides relevant to your sector. Sometimes it's more than one. So a hairdresser is a close contact business. When it has staff meetings, it's an office place. Um, when you're taking in uh, supplies, there's also other guidance around dealing with suppliers. So there's a range of things, a range of guides that might be relevant to yourself. I recommend um, where possible download the guide because in the PDF version, there's a tick box which contains a checklist that you can run through to uh, satisfy yourself that you've done everything that was contained within the guide. Also review your trade association guides. Those are a lot more personalized to your profession. Obviously government's done their best. You know, they are gonna come up with guides for every sector out there. Um, we have heard complaints in terms of the close contact se sector um, for businesses feeling that um, it was too general. It covered too many different kinds of professions that operate in very different ways. Um, so look at your trade association guides. Those are unique to yourself. You have one uh, that represents hairdressers, nail bars. You have others that represent uh, soft tissue industry. Those are unique in, uh, in terms of the advice, risks, um, and uh, you'll find those very helpful. In terms of risk assessments, it's not just a case of, uh, well, let's borrow my friends uh, next door because they're in the same business as me, and so I'll just kind of do what they've done. 
it is really unique to you. Um, lots of things can vary. For example, the size of your indoor outdoor space, how many staff you have, um, how many customers and the way that you um, uh, bring customers in and outside of your property, the configuration of your property, entry, exits. It's a range of things that can uh, significantly affect how the risks that are applicable to your massage therapy place versus your neighbor's massage um, therapy premise. We can't go into detail in risk assessments naturally for every business, but this is just one way to think about it. Obviously, you can look at the various guides, um, but this is this is just gives you an inkling of the level of detail that you need to get into. So you would think about the customer journey before they visit, uh, when they enter and exit, during the visit, so both during the treatment, uh, they need to use toilets, and they need to wait. Think about that in the context of suppliers when they're drop, dropping off supplies. What about your staff journey? Before they come to work, they've had to travel. They will have had their own face covering on. Uh, when they leave work, they've been wearing a uniform. Uh, now, clothes are low risk, but could become contaminated. So you need to give some advice uh, around that to staff. Don't assume that they'll know all this. You know, so you need to really get into this detail about changing clothes as soon as they get home, washing at 60 degrees, because we're all being, you know, taught to be environmentally friendly and we're all washing at 40 or 30. Um, for them to wash hands thoroughly after touching the clothes. Now, obviously, we can't all trade outdoors. Uh, uh, you can't do massage, uh, you know, out in the street. So, uh, you know, you need to uh, obviously um, have much of your business indoors. So you need to look at minimizing those risks. <clears throat> now, there has been months of fear, you know, in the news and the media around, uh, you know, the virus being on surfaces for up to three days. And that's why we need to, you know, we all need to clean, clean uh, all the time. Uh, then again, the knowledge in this area has evolved. So we now know that the virus uh, drops by half after several hours, it keeps dropping. Um, and this is why you'll see some uh, official advice from uh, Centers of Disease Control in various countries talking about um, touching surfaces that has the virus on it, it is now thought to be um, less of a risk and not the main way that the virus uh, spreads. Cleaning the hand washing is still important, don't get me wrong, but the highest risk appears to be from these aerosols. So noting this, good ventilation is a priority. Now, in the follow-up information you'll get, there's 15 practical recommendations from uh, heating ventilation experts. Uh, that runs through from the basics, keep your doors and windows open. Um, essentially, what you're trying to do, by any means possible, get, is get as much fresh air into the premise to flush out any virus particles. Where that's impossible, you're trying to dilute the level of particles that are still in the air by bringing in as much air as you can. So you're doing that using fans to push air around the building and out. You use an air conditioning units if you have, but do uh, you have to make sure that you're bringing in fresh air, not uh, using recirculation mode. There's other uh, uh, advice in here, which includes toilet flushing uh, tips, uh, staff activities in un unventilated rooms like basement storage areas. So do you have a look at that? Social distancing is still one of the important uh, risk mitigations. Um, there is, has been a bit of confusion from various businesses around this drop from two meters to one meter. Some businesses suddenly thought, well, one, one meter is safe. Other businesses, uh, lots of questions around what is mitigation. Um, so here's, you know, hopefully a little bit of understanding what we, we mean by this. So first of all, one meter is not safe. Um, just a mild cough uh, uh, will travel up to six meters. Um, one meter away has between two to 10 times greater risk than standing two meters apart from someone. Um, so the context behind this change uh, was really to help you guys survive. You know, obviously you can't operate and keep two meters apart. Um, although you may see some countries hairdressers were using mops and other things to cut people's hairs. So uh, some countries, you know, took quite a, a different approach. Um, 
So that's the context. It's a trying to find a balance between keeping everyone safe and obviously allowing you guys to, to, to operate um, in, in a safe way. So in terms of mitigation for large droplets, these cough, sneeze droplets that usually fall within uh, what we thought was two meters, but sometimes it's up to six meters. That's where seat configuration is important, sitting side by side, back to back. So as you're coughing or talking and it releases particles from your mouth, they're not going towards someone's face. Um, it's giving, even if you're sitting side by side with someone else, you're breathing out, your particles are going in front of you, and it's giving some time for the air that's moving around the room to dilute those particles. Um, this is why we talked about screens, so screens in between staff and customers, screens in between different customers, um, face visors acting as a close uh, screen between staff and customers. For aerosols, these tiny par particles that float around the air, you need to have different mitigation, um, and that is ventilation, pretty much. Ventilation is the thing. Um, also, effective face coverings, and I'm going to get into some detail around that. So, here's kind of, uh, you know, hopefully this picture kind of makes it more meaningful, what I've just been talking about. So, this was uh, a place that I visited um, over a month ago. Uh, when we were doing our kind of you know spot checks and advice visits to businesses um and i thought this was fine you know um you the customer sits on one side of this you'll see hopefully you can make out there's three clear perspex screens you can just make out uh the, the mirror uh, effect of those um so that was a screen between customers on the right hand of the picture and and the staff on the left hand and so even though they are less than two meters apart, if either was coughing, sneezing, that barrier is there to protect the other person. So that seemed fine, although obviously there's no, there's no barriers there between three the customers. Um, so really, um, they should only seat one customer at the furthest left, leave a space, and another customer to the furthest right seat in that picture. Now, you can see what I'm talking about more clearly here. So these customers are sitting side by side, that's great. They're less than one meter apart. Um, so we need to think, well, these are actually not even one meter apart. So it should really be one meter minimum plus mitigation. Um, so, but let's say they were sitting one meter apart. The business has put in place these screens between customers. So they're doing what they thought was, you know, the, the right to keep customers safe and that's fine when we're talking about cough and sneeze droplets but not when we're talking about these fine aerosols because what will happen is um, hopefully you can pick it out in the picture if you look at the screen that's um, so not the first screen to the right but the one the next one uh, left of that you'll see it's fixed to the table and you, so the customer sits on the chair and the staff is sitting um, behind, across from them with the nail, uh, the shelves of nails, um, nail polish behind them. Now there's a huge kind of one and a half, two meter gap between that screen and the back wall with all the nail polish. So obviously a customer sitting there, breathing, talking, uh, all these aerosol particles are floating around, going around the screen, um, it's not really doing anything to stop those particles floating around. What that business needs to do to keep customers safe is, yes, the screens, but then flush out these particles with um, fresh air coming through the premise. Some other things to consider, let the sun in as much as you can. Most of the virus is killed off within seven minutes of sunshine. But uh, windows stop the virus killing UVC rays. So they do let, let in UVA rays, but not the, not the UVC that kills the virus. So with that in mind, um, obviously you might be used to buying um, um, sterilizing equipment. You get equipment that sterilizes combs in a little um, kind of metal container, and those do kill off um, bacteria and viruses. But you may have also seen online uh, adverts for 
UV light sterilizers where you put a light up on your ceiling or mount it in your premise and it's saying this will kill 100% of vi virus um, and people could be walking around quite happily underneath this being virus free. Well, that is a scam if you do see it because UVC rays whilst they kill the virus, they also are very harmful to humans. So um, those uh, products shouldn't be uh, on the market and anything you see that's making those claims is highly likely to be a scam. Um, the latest thinking is that um, there is UVC ray uh, light sterilizers that are being uh, looked at, being explored um, by scientists, etc. But they believe those won't be available on the market till after the pandemic's uh, uh, finished. Um, and so, and you will see a lot in the media as and when these products um, are on the market. Okay, some other things. Uh, keep it indoor humidity levels to 50-60%. That may seem high, um, but this is, a, this is the normal comfortable level um, for uh, humans, 40-60%. to The higher uh, anything above 60% starts to feel really humid. But if you keep the humidity around that level, what it does is it allows the droplets to retain their moisture when you're talking, etc those particles, sorry, droplets fall to the floor, to surfaces, rather than become those tiny aerosols. So that's a benefit there. Um, you need to be mindful of this, um, or I should say, generally speaking, though it differs building to building and, and areas around the country, um, humidity will be in the kind of 35 to 45% area as a norm in this country. Um, but you do need to be mindful of humidity on, on colder days because when you start putting up the indoor heating, humidity levels can drop to around 20% uh, and therefore you then enable more of the aerosol particles uh, to float around as people talk, etc. Keeping noise levels to minimum. So talking louder generates more virus particles than talking quietly. So no, it's a sports broadcast, loud music are big no-nos. Just to give you some, again, context really here, what we're talking about, um, because I'm a firm believer that most businesses want to do the right thing. Um, but like me, when I first read the guidance, I had lots of questions, why are we being asked to do this or that? And I'm having to explain these rules and guidance to businesses. So um, I'm sure you're as curious as I. Well, this is, this is what the scientists have found. Um, just one minute of loud speaking could generate at least 1,000 virus containing droplets. So 1,000 droplets in just one minute of speaking. And this is why um, the emphasis is on limiting talking uh, as much as possible. I know it's difficult, these things are not practical. Um, you guys are in business, uh, not something to take money, but you form relationships with your customers. Talking to them is a normal part of, uh, of the way you work and you want to build those relationships with customers uh, you know, want to come back. But this is, the, this is the new normal, the new reality for a while. And it, you know, it's important that we do as much as possible follow these uh, recommendations. Time is a factor. Now, standing next to somebody with a virus doesn't mean to say you'll pick it up within a few seconds. Um, it's not like you're within two meters of someone and, and that's it, it's transmit. The, it's reported that you need to breathe in a few hundred or a few thousand of the virus particles that they're breathing out. So just say you are next to someone one to two meters away, loud talking towards your face, nobody's wearing face coverings, thousand virus particles are coming from the virus carrier towards your face. If it's not a breeze, there's no ventilation, you know, one, two minutes could potentially be enough for you to have breathed in and off of the virus particles that they're breathing out. Now, the science is still evolving on this. We're still trying to understand all of this. Uh, and so, you know, I might be way out when I'm saying a few minutes is sufficient. Um, I'm just showing you the information that is to hand which you can obviously read yourself and it's all there in the follow-up information you can get into the detail but putting those two bits of information together is you know obviously the reasoning why i i'm talking about a few minutes 
in terms of what's out there in official guidance, um, 15 minutes is the uh, point at which Track and Trace uh, want to have a conversation with anybody that's been near somebody uh, with the virus and at a distance of less than two meters, uh, if they've been near them for more than 15 minutes, they want to trace that person and test them. Okay, so that is a little very rough kind of guideline of what to work to. And that's obviously in a context where nobody's wearing face coverings because that changes things a lot. And we're going to detail that now shortly. So that's a lot to take in. I'm going to give you a break from uh, the science, the a lot of that context. And, and move you on to our industry speakers to get their perspective and hear about their guidance. Okay, uh, so I'm Caroline Larrissey, I'm Director of Quality Standards of the National Hair and Beauty um, Federation. If we can go on to the next slide, Paul, that'd be great. Um, so what we've been doing um, for our members and the wider sector is putting some of this guidance into plain English. Um, because a lot of the information that's come out there has been, you know, quite a lot of information, quite detailed documents. And what we've tried to do is to provide daily updates. So if you go on to our website, which is the National Hair and Beauty oh. Federation website, um, you'll find a coronavirus hub. And we've been doing daily updates and putting this information into bite-sized chunks um, as part of that. So as you rightly moved on to Paul, uh, um, we're all working to the close contact services guidance that's been issued um, by the government. Uh, and what I wanted to do was just go through some of the, uh, um, the key points within the, uh, um, the guidance. So who does the guidance apply to? Well, it's hairdressers, barbers, beauty salons, nail bars, makeup, tattoos, spray tanning, spas, sports, ma massage therapy, well-being, holistic, across the board uh, uh, as part of that. It does include mobile services, although there is further guidance um, for specific for mobile services. And and it also covers those that are studying vocational qualifications in environments, so like apprenticeships as well. Now, the guidelines cover the practical considerations about work, how to work safely and to minimise the spread. So, but each salon or barbershop will need to translate this into their specific actions. So what you will see on our website is a load of various different information, including risk assessments and templates and stuff to help salons be able to do that and make sure they can do it in manageable chunks. Now, there's very much guidance on there of what you should be wearing while you're working in a salon and what your client should be wearing. So in a salon, it should be a full visor that covers the full facial area as part of that. Now, at the moment, it, it, we've got guidance in there, but also what we need to make sure is that salons are complying with this guidance um, because there is going to be stricter regimes coming in about monitoring salons and making sure that people are completing the risk assessments and are taking these mitigation, mitigated actions to be able to reduce the risk as part of that. One of the key things is making sure that if you are COVID-19 secure, you put that blue template in the uh, window of your salon or in a, a secure area as part of that. Key thing for a salon is make sure your clients know what they expect. One of the ways that you can cut down on the client being in the salon is you may be able to do a phone conversation, a phone consultation before they go in. Walk them through what they're going to expect when they're coming into the salon just to make sure they understand what they need to do, where the higher sanitation points are, you know, where they need to go to if they're waiting in between colour services why they have to pre-book a treatment and making sure that your staff are very very clear on what areas they're working in and who they're working with and if they're paired up with other members in the team that it's very clear what area they're assigned to and how the salon and how the client moves around that salon to make sure you've got the social distancing place making sure you've got those screens and barriers making sure that you are working either from the side or from the back um, as, as part of that 
as I said before, it's very, very important to make sure you have the right personal protective equipment. So please use your personal protective equipment that you would normally wear in the salon, but obviously with the additional mitigation measures as part of that, making sure that your clients have face coverings in England when they actually arrive in the salon. A lot of salons good practice is they would have face coverings available on the reception area so that if a client does try to walk into the salon without a face covering, they have got that there ready for their client uh, going forward. Can we move on to the next slide, please? Um, so what I said before is we've been doing a lot of updates. What we've been clear is making sure that the guidance is in plain English. We've been speaking to government. So if there's been any areas of clarification, we've asked the questions. And believe you me, some of our members have got in touch with some really quite bizarre questions, but we've made sure these are on our website. And so you'll see oodles are frequently asked questions, both from a business perspective and a technical perspective um, as part of that. So please do log on to the website. You go on to the next page, please, Paul. We have ourselves provided our own guidance uh, um, for uh, opening of the salons. And this specifically looks at the particular measures needed to take in place in hair, beauty and barbering salons. Uh, um, so it has a little bit more of walking your client around the salon and the key points that you'd want to be able to do uh, to protect your clients and protect your staff within the salon. We've tailored it so it's in an easy format, so it's very, very clear on the precise things that you need to take in account to the salon without overburdening the uh, um, reader with loads and loads of technical uh, um, information. It walks, walks you through health and safety, what treatments and services you should provide, what types of cleaning, ventilation, laundry, handling tips, social distance, uh, distancing, all the things that you would expect um, to see um, as part of that. We're also working uh, um, or have worked with trading standards and bays, and we're actually in the process of just developing a further guidance that will be available from our, on our website. Now, what we have on our website is we have our information for our members, but because of this, uh, extraordinary situation what we have done is put all the guidance out there for everybody to be able to uh, get and download as much as possible so what you'll also see is uh, thanks Paul I was just about to say we on to the next slide is we've put uh, quite a number of frequently asked questions um, and some of the key areas that uh, have been asked so for example can I use a hairdryer in the salon well yes and there's no restrictions on a um, hairdryer. How long can I spend with a client? Well, we've been, gone to, back to the government loads of times and asked this specific question, and there is no set limit on how you, long you spend with the client. What you have to do is you have to do that risk assessment for those treatments and services that you are completing. Taking into account, you should be standing at the side of the client or at the back of the client, and minimizing the time spent. So what we've suggested is working around the client. So continually moving around the salon uh, client while you're actually delivering a service um, as part of that. So another one of the questions was, do I need to offer an appointment system? Well, the government guideline says that it should be an appointment system because what you're looking towards is looking at a uh, um, those mitigations and making sure that you're applying those social distancing measures. So making sure you have an appointment system, make sure you manage how many people you're in your salon at one time as part of that. So how many people are entering and exiting in the salon. And that when it comes back to being really clear to the client before they actually enter the salon, what service they are coming for, what limitations may be on that service, and that you may not be able to extend that service because you may have a further client booked in later. And so therefore they may have to recome back for another service or think about what exactly what they need as part of that service. 
Again, there's also information on guidelines and PPE and all those various different things. One of the key things within the salon is making sure you keep a record of your clients that come in for appointment. You must keep a temporary record of any client and visitors for 21 days to assist the NHS test and trace system uh, as part of that. And it's really important to make sure that that information is clear and is logged as soon as your client comes through the door as part of that. We move on to the next slide, please, Paul. So one of the things on our website is all the various different memberships. Because of this uh, um, situation that we're in in the moment, we have got a number of various memberships options that are available uh, uh, for people to look at. So please have a look at our website and have a look at the information. And whether that's from free, free membership to salon membership to group membership to trade membership, there's always the information there. And what we've tried to do is make sure sure that all our guides and services and blogs are tailored to a specific group as part of that. We go on to the next slide. So I think one of the biggest things that we've tried to do over this period is really uh, um, linking with people via our social media channels. And I think now I think we've got up to 77,000 people on our Facebook book 60 odd thousand on our Instagram and anytime any government information comes out then that's the channel that we're using at the moment because it's about informing industry and supporting businesses to be as safe as effective as they possibly can during this time. Uh, next slide please. Oh that's it for me then thank you. <laughs> I think you're on mute Paul. Yeah Thanks very much, Caroline. We're going to pick up Q&A. Uh, all the panel uh, speakers will be available at the end for Q&A. So we're now going to move on to Maria Dane, who's uh, one of the RSP's health and safety inspectors. Maria, you might be muted. Um, um, I think I'm okay. You can hear me, no. can you, everyone? Yeah. Okay. Hello, everyone. Um, so first of all, I'll, I'll start with the, the RIDOR. So the RIDOR stands for um, Reporting of Diseases and Dangerous Occurrences Regulations 2013, but it's just known as RIDOR and that's what everyone seems to refer to it as. And it puts duties on the employer, the self-employed and the people in control of the work premises. So that's the people that might be responsible for certain parts of the, the building if you're, in a, um, you're hiring a space within another building. And they, they have a duty to report any serious workplace accidents, any occupational diseases and any specified dangerous occurrences, which is things like near misses. But that details of or near misses and any other clarification is all on the HSC website. There's no requirement um, for any members of the public to report any um, coronavirus cases um, under, the, under the RIDOR. Um, it's just it's only for work related um, transmission and anything that's yeah anything that occurs in the workplace so if a person has has been diagnosed as having COVID-19 and is attributed to occupational exposure to coronavirus this must be reported as a case of a disease under the online reporting system and it, unfortunately if a worker dies as a result of occupational exposure for coronavirus this um, needs to be reported as a death due to the exposure of a biological agent so just to get clarification it's all on the website it details what what which um, category it falls under. So it's a work-related disease if you just if someone's got a case of it and they work and it's due to exposure and if it's a death it has to go as a biological, biological agent. Um, you've got to notify the enforcing authority which will be for all the sectors that we're talking about today will be your local environment health department um, as soon as possible so you can make a telephone conversation there or an email as soon or getting in touch with someone if there is a work-related death and you need to follow up that with report within 10 days time. <clears throat> um, you, need, you can use the online um, HSC website to do that um, and you must ensure that all the people that do the RIDOR, it needs to be a responsible person so just make sure someone in your business does know about the RIDOR regulations because it's up to them to, to report um, any RIDOR cases, it's a responsible person for, so that will be the employer, uh, a self-employed person or any person in control will need to submit the, um, the RIDOR report um, there's an emergency number obviously if something happens and it's a fatality um, the website's 
open all the time, but obviously Monday to Friday, it's open from 8.30 to 5. And that emergency number is 0345 300 9923. And um, obviously we've talked about risk assessment, but obviously under the management of um, Health and Safety at Work Acts, you do have a responsibility to do a risk assessment. So if you do your risk assessment, it's going to be, if you put all your mitigating factors, it's going to be very hard, very unlikely that the person will get exposure through work if you've put everything in place and you've got that justification. So it's really, really important that everyone puts their mitigation in place so they don't and um, they can't be held reliable in, in a health and safety case in the event that something is attributed to to the work environment. So that's that's all. I, and the twin, go, moving on, I think Caroline did cover a lot of this, but we're talking about the track and trace. So every business, um, the position from the regulation side of thing is that every business is expected to, to get the details of all the customers. Where you book appointments, that's going to be quite easy. You, you, can, you just need the name of the customer, the date that they came, an approximate time, and who did the treatment. So, and you need to keep that for 21 days. Obviously, if you've got a booking system, you'll have that information already. But where I'm going out finding barbers that are doing off the street bookings, I'm asking them just to keep a simple um, diary and date it and put the time and just keep that away from customers or if they're getting the customers to fill it out they need to take it away afterwards and sanitize the pen so you still have to procedures around um, the track and trace details if you are doing a manual um, list of customer details uh, details need to be 21 days that's absolutely clear um, yeah, and uh, just just a general overview about the NHS track and trace. If you are contacted by NHS track and trace, you'll be given specific instructions um, to follow. Obviously, it's if you've got a case, it's a 14 day. You've got to isolate straight away, and any of your household have to isolate. But if you've just been contacted by track and trace as you've been in exposure, then they'll give you the specific guidance. And any any business that has been attributed to a, a potential outbreak will be followed up by the Environment Health Department anyway. So you don't have to worry there. You'll be given specific advice from Public Health England or your Environment Health Department. Um, I think obviously everyone knows about the, the key things to look for, uh, obviously if you've got a high temperature, persistent cough, any change or loss of taste or smell, they're the key things um, and ultimately um, it's your responsibility under the Health and Safety at Work Act. Um, so you'll be expected to put all reasonable steps and procedures in place to safeguard your staff and also anyone that's affected by your work activity, so your customers too. So you do have that responsibility. Um, just thinking now, the last thing probably would be just the details of the track and trace. I mean, obviously, if you've got coronavirus, get on straight on the website. The 111, 119 number is, is, a, is available for you to order a test, but everything is on the Public Health England websites or the .gov websites. I think that probably covers most things, Paul. Just probably yeah, yeah, if I've missed great. anything. That, that, that's great, yeah. <laughs> but, I mean, obviously we're going out as, as an enforcement perspective. We are go, going out to give as much advice as we, as we can. Things change, so just be mindful things do change in, in terms of like the mask recently. Um, people need to now wear masks, customers as well as, as potentially staff if they need to as part of their risk assessment. So the main thing is make sure the risk assessment is appropriate to your business. Don't just do a generic one. Think about your ventilation, everything else that goes with that business. And, and you should have enough mitigation then in the event that something does go wrong. You've got to be seen to be doing what's practical and reasonable. That's all we're looking for. OK. Hi, thanks, Maria. Thanks for that. So I just want to highlight this. Uh, you may have already heard that work in the highest risk zone, which is your face, um, uh, can't be done until 15th of August. Um, there, if you follow this link on the NHFBF site, you'll get a full list of the activities that can and can't be done. Uh, that's updated frequently. Um, and I want to just take this opportunity to highlight uh, this point as well. Even when you do get permission to work in people's faces, that doesn't mean to say all the treatments you'll do in that area will be safe. Threading is one example, one high risk activity. Um, it's traditional, the traditional method is to have the, um, the thread in your mouth. And, uh, but however, there's a risk attached to that. Saliva is one of the um, ways of transmitting the virus. And so you cannot be over somebody's face while doing that treatment and risk saliva dropping out. The other thing is it's difficult to do with a face visor and certainly with a face covering. 
so you need to uh, change processes. That's quite an obvious example. There may be others that are less obvious. So really think about all the treatments you do and whether you need to change things around and then make sure there's adequate training of staff around those changes and reasons for the change. Uh, we've had a lot of questions from businesses over the months around face coverings, visors, what they should, shouldn't buy, should I wear a visor or a covering or both. So uh, I just want to pick up those common queries. You'll be thinking about this in terms of what you buy for your own staff, your policies for customers, or what you're going to purchase in terms of face covering for yourself as a citizen. So we've got uh, PPE masks, which are the ones like the KN95 and the FFP1 masks that you see in the picture there. Those have been tested against standards to show that they'll protect the wearer from 90% plus of virus particles that are around in the air. There's an international shortage of PPE, which is why we say, you know, you need to reserve these for those in medical settings and other really high risk um, jobs. Face coverings um, are not PPE, so they may be cloth or other material. Um, that means they haven't been tested to a standard. Their effectiveness varies significantly. And it's really important to be mindful of this because uh, one face covering can stop just 1% of particles um, um, from being breathed, coughed out, versus others that can stop 95%. Uh, and surprisingly, some homemade face coverings are actually more effective than those uh, that you can buy in the shops. Now, there's lots of studies where they have shared this information around for a few months now, but um, there's one recent one that's come to light, which I wanted to show you, and that really kind of puts it across in a visual way. So as it says in the video here, face mask is there to capture the large droplets that escape when you cough. They bought lots of different face coverings. This is a homemade bandana. So it's folded, you know, and it's uh, double layered. And you'll see all of this smoke that's coming out that is replicates uh, a cough. And so that was quite ineffective. And you compare that with a homemade thick fabric mask. And you'll see hardly any um, smoke comes out of the front of the, uh, of the mask. There was some leakage above the nose, um, but in terms of protecting others around you that are right in front of you, um, that was very effective. Now this is a professional grade uh, mask purchased in the shops, and you'll see there's a lot more leakage in the front of that one. So that's just, you know, you can look at this in your leisure, but just to, I think it's a really helpful visual, um, example of so we can't go into the detail all of all the fabrics were tested but generally speaking lots of these studies being done different labs loosely woven fabrics the likes of scarves they'll only stock around 20 percent of particles this is even double layered scarf whereas the most effective materials is two layers of quilters coffin uh quilters cotton or a even better hybrid construction so one layer of 100% cotton, second layer silk or flannel providing up to 95% filtration from the wearer's uh, cough breathing particles as they're wearing it. Now that is how much that mask is, that face covering is protecting other people around them. It isn't saying that the face covering will protect the wearer up to 95%. However, a, a recent development uh, was a, a July study. Um, so you may be aware for many months it's been reported face coverings are about protecting others, not the wearer. Um, recent study looking at um, different uh, hospitals around the world where staff were wearing face coverings. And they found that um, those staff wearing coverings uh, had less uh, 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 less of them were picking up the virus. So it does seem from initial research that face coverings can offer some protection to the wearer, although we can't quantify it at this stage. Face visors. 
a study done a few years ago um, showing that it does offer this high level of protection from sneezing and coughing, but it's not as effective to the wearer or those people around them in terms of the wearer breathing in particles or when they're talking, um, breathing out those particles uh, being stopped in the mask. Clearly not, because as soon as you breathe out, it's all kind of floating around the face visor, even when it comes below the chin or wraps around the face, those aerosol particles can float around uh, out and drift uh, into your, the air inside your premise. This is why a visor it, it by itself is not enough. Um, so the law change was updated. Uh, it was used to be the case that customers come into close contact services, didn't have to wear face covering, that changed. Um, I'm not clear if it's the same all over the UK, but if it's not, um, you know, the law is there, uh, obviously is, uh, uh, um, the law um, is something obviously that needs to be abided, but if there isn't a law requiring face coverings for your customers, there's nothing to stop you having your own company policy that requires your customers to come in with a covering for all the reasons that have already been discussed. Now there is exemptions. Do you be aware of that? Some people uh, don't have to wear a covering for medical reasons. Some, for example, have breathing difficulties. So how do you deal with those? Now, I'm just going to example this in a, a massage setting. So I want to thank GCMT for sending this uh, to me. This is a really nice video which just examples uh, what I want to talk about. So imagine a customer is lying down, they've got breathing difficulties, they can't wear a face covering, but you want to offer them some protection and also staff from that person when the customer is breathing out the particles. So using a pillowcase, uh, kind of replicates to some extent wearing a face covering. Bearing in mind what was said about material can make a big difference. So two layers of 100% cotton or flannel shirts, you know, you can, uh, sure it doesn't have to be a pillowcase, but it needs to be something um, that um, is not loosely woven. Gloves, there's been different advice in Scotland versus England. So that's raised questions, which they should be followed? What is the right advice? Um, obviously, you should follow the official advice wherever possible, not just because that is uh, the best guidance that's around in terms of protecting yourself, but you may have insurance implications if you're not following the official advice. Um, I would just uh, say this in terms of skin to skin contact. As long as both parties had washed their hands, and so any virus that they might have picked up when they touch surfaces, you cannot transmit the virus just by skin to skin. It doesn't pass by sweat. Um, uh, now, if you have open wounds, that's something completely different. Um, that's the PHE advice, Public Health England advice. Um, who advice on this subject is gloves are for medical settings. Um, they encourage, and you'll see this in other government sector guides, frequent hand washing is encouraged rather than gloves. That was certainly advice for a long time for retailers when we were getting these questions, do people working in supermarkets have to wear gloves? The, the advice generally uh, across different sectors has been, uh, you know, frequent hand washing, I think every 30 minutes uh, was the guidance, but you'll, you'll see that in the guide yourself. Reason being was because we're human. Yeah, we all, without even thinking, touch our faces more than 23 times an hour. And, and it's very difficult to be that strict with yourself that um, change of gloves in between every customer. That might seem something that's easily, easily done. But what if you are treating a customer, doing something on their hair, it might be an hour treatment, you have to pause. Um, you go away doing something else, you touch computers, you touch uh, your booking register, um, and you pick up the virus from, other, from some other surface. I'm just giving you an example here. Um, it can be very difficult to be that strict and that conscious of what you're doing with your hands. And so this is why they say that gloves can be, unfortunately, a, you know, a source of uh, virus because you land up touching all these surfaces 
um, touching your face, etc. You think the gloves are clean, uh, and uh, you know you then pass that on to um, customers in, in some way by touching their near their face. So um, what I'm saying at the bottom there is, if you're not happy with official or trade association guidance on this or any the subject, obviously you raise that with your trade association. They are there to represent your views to government and also hear your concerns or comments input in relation to their own guidance. So that's it from me for now. I'm now going to pass on to our, our second industry expert, uh, discuss what the GCMT have been doing um, for soft tissue, especially. Hello, good afternoon. Um, here's my information, Jenny Park Matheson. I'm a soft tissue specialist, and a deep tissue massage specialist. So we use the word soft tissue to separate out the difference between different forms of therapy. Um, I trained with the organisation you see there, the Massage Training Institute, and that is a member of the GCMT. Now, I think there's a slide with various logos. Um, GCMT, the Council for Soft Tissue Therapies, is an umbrella organisation that represents probably about just over a quarter of the people who are uh, soft tissue therapists in the UK, which includes Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. Soft tissue does include sports and we are sports and massage therapy. And we now have our own government guidelines as to who we are. Um, the reason that we are what we do is that we are very, very specific in terms that we do one-to-one, -one, we don't do group work, and the majority of people work in a one-to-one -one environment. We represent all of these different organisations, some of which are professional associations that train, professional association, associations that support members, and other of which are uh, assessing organisations. So it's a very broad remit. The bottom line of which is that we support people in this industry. However, as we found out that there are a vast number of people operating in the UK who may have trained with an organisation but are not members. And we found a lot of the uh, supporting documentation we're generating had been used by them too. So we're actually getting to a far larger percentage of the therapeutic world than we thought we were. People who work as sports and massage therapists tend to do it in one of four ways. They're usually self-employed, they're normally one-to-one, -one. A large number of people work from home and sometimes will have a clinic in their own space. Sometimes will have a clinic in their own space with a separate entrance. Some will work in a clinic which will be a multidisciplined clinic so that they may be uh, acupuncturists, uh, reflexologists, osteopaths, pathologists, uh, um, physiotherapists, all working in the same building. And the fourth, which is something that we were surprised was given the AOK when we got the AOK's work, is that people are mobile therapists who go into other people's homes. As an organisation, we support all of these different professional associations, mostly on industry issues, training issues, timing issues, uh, sometimes legal issues. When the virus hit, it became abundantly clear we needed to do far more than that. And out of our team of people, we've got about 16 members of the board, some of whom are executive and the rest are members of organisations like myself. We chose a crisis uh, team to actually put together the paperwork that everybody was going to need. And the first thing we did in June was put together the guidelines and recommendations. So long before people got back to work, but it gave them the opportunity to look at what we were going to recommend that they do to get back to work. And it was like a big ask for a lot of people because it was putting them right outside their comfort zone. Once we produced those guidelines, we then realized that there was something else we had to produce and that was the resource pack. And what you'll see on this slide there are some of the elements of the resource pack. This is a supporting document. It turned out originally it was gonna be about five pages and it ended up at well over 30, but it's everything that everybody needs to get them back to work. It's a list of uh, guidelines, a list of what you need to do, what you need to do in relation to your clients, existing and up and coming, what you need to do in terms of preparing yourself and your premises to be worked in, and out the other side, the supporting paperwork, which is hugely important. The wearing of PPE, what is required, what isn't, the cleaning, the cleansing. Um, masses and masses of stuff, which will all involve buying, investing on top of just actually coming into grips with the fact that you were going to be working in a totally different environment. 
So we put this quite sizable document together. The guidelines and recommendations were written by two colleagues of mine, and then we all piled in with uh, recommendations and additions, and we kept that updated. The resource pack ended up being my baby, quite how, I don't know, but everybody who's on the crisis team has a series of qualifications which combined give us all of the information we need, the administrative capability, the legal capability, and so on and so forth. So this document was produced. Again, it was produced before we were given the clearance to go back to work, and we uploaded it. We then saw that as things were changing, that that needed to adapt, and quite by chance, the version two happened to tie in with the date that we finally got the AAOK to go back to work. Now, some of the paperwork's very important are things like the consent forms. You can see screening and consent. We as an organization, therapists, will always do with a new client uh, a consultation beforehand. That is usually done immediately prior to the first um, appointment. We can't do that because face-to-face -face is not recommended for the simple fact of being close to each other for half an hour, three quarters of an hour, even with a mask and any droplets that get into the air. So we would now do that in advance and we would do it on a Zoom or a phone call. So that's again putting people right outside their comfort zone. However, once done, it actually works fine and I find it's quite enjoyable. But the point is you then have to work out how you're going to charge for all of that and the time you're going to take. However, the most important document in there is the consent form and the screening for COVID, which asks a lot of really quite impertinent questions, but extremely important impertinent questions. Supporting that and your guidance of what to do is the risk assessment. Now, everybody's mentioned risk assessment. I uh, am a, a massage tutor, I run my own school. So risk assessments are a normal part of my daily life. For a lot of therapists, it's nothing like part of their daily life. It's very scary. And we produced a massive example risk assessment, which covers off masses of different elements. There's another slide behind this, which does a list of some of the items. And that's literally to do with your premises. How are people going to get in? How are you going to be uh, approaching them when they come in? What are you going to do? And it involves absolutely everything. If you're working from home, you have to clean the whole place. You take up the carpets, the rugs, unless they're fixed. You remove cushions, you remove books, you remove plants, you cover everything, you cleanse everything before the client comes in. When they've gone, you cleanse it all again. There's guidelines about gaps in between seeing clients. It's very tiring doing that. The first time I did it, it took two hours to set up beforehand and half an hour to clean afterwards. And I'll tell you, I was knackered. An important element, of course, and we've covered it off, is the wearing of PPE, the PPE requirements. I will say when we finally got the go-ahead to work, which was a week after we'd originally been told we were going to go to work, we got the 4th of July was waived in us and then taken away. Unfortunately, the government went down a rather government line, which is not really giving us any clear guidance and leaving you to make up your own mind, which also means that it becomes your fault if something goes wrong. And they come up with this bright idea of everybody wearing a visor. Now, it may be appropriate if you're a hairdresser, where you're working beside and behind, working in therapy, one-to-one, -one, close body contact, skin to skin, a visor is absolutely useless, because essentially whatever you, you do on the inside of it falls out the bottom all over your client. So we immediately introduced, yes, you need to wear a mask as well, and a proper surgical mask. Not all these try your own thing ones, because they don't necessarily work. We know the surgical masks do. The other thing that came up with the PPE, um, was that because we were working skin to skin that we would need to wear gloves. However, there was a codicil which meant you might not to if you choose not to, which again causes everybody to go into a major debate about it, which has taken up hours and hours and hours of everybody's time. Some work is difficult to do in gloves, most of it is fine to do in gloves. You then have the uh, people who don't want to wear gloves, the people who don't want to be massaged in gloves, etc, etc, etc. We as an organisation, the GCMT, to all of our professional associations said, we recommend you use full PPE. So visor, mask, apron and gloves. We spoke to our insurers. There's a company called Balans. Many of you would be very, very uh, aware of Balans. They work in the complementary therapy field. So they also work with other people in the complementary therapy field, including uh, healers and so on. And they eventually came out in support of us and said, you either have to follow the government guidelines or you have to cover your professional association guidelines. We recommend you follow your PA guidelines because they've thought about this long and hard and it's to do with making a safeguard for you and your clients. If you make a decision not to, you have to clinically reason this in your paperwork. 
As a consequence, therefore, you do paperwork before a client comes, paperwork when they're there, paperwork when they've gone. If you make a decision not to wear a visor or gloves or whatever, you have to say why. The problem with that is if you decide not to and it's a whim as opposed to a necessity, like somebody's asthmatic or somebody is, is allergic, you run the risk of your insurance not being valid. So therefore, our recommendation is use the PPE. It is really not difficult. Get used to it. Yes, I know it's hot and uncomfortable, but do it. So we found with the feedback from our members through emails, Facebook groups, Q&As, that it was enormously valuable to have this. You can argue about it if you want to change things, but you've got a call to support you. Um, we then produced some FAQs because there were lots of things that came up relentlessly that people wanted to know about. PPE, do you take temperatures when clients come? Uh, do you need to take a COSH course, COSHH, which is about uh, hazardous materials, i.e. cleaning materials, and how to put on and take off PPE properly. If you watch Casualty in Holby City, I don't know what they taught them in those hospitals, but they don't take off PPE properly. You don't want to be doing that in your environment. Uh, also, people wanted to talk about session timings. That's come up. There is no guideline. However, and this is the important part of the risk assessment, which is not there, is that you have to risk assess your client, not just your facilities and you, but your client. There are a large number of red flags that the NHS have put up about various conditions people have, which are not appropriate to massage or raise questions. You therefore are required to risk assess every single person as to what those requirements are and whether you feel safe to see, safe to see that client or not. We also added a three page just for mobile visits for people going into other people's homes, because again, there have been confusing guidelines. First, they said you can go to someone's home if they've been shielding, because it's clean and the only problem is you. Then they said you can't do that and now they're wavering. So one of the important things is making sure that you stay absolutely up to date with all the, all the new information, which unfortunately is drip fed in such a way that you have to really be on the ball to pick it up. This slide here, the one at the bottom, um, people can still come inside your home for specific purposes. That's relevant only to the north of England, which was in lockdown a week and a half ago when uh, Leicester was already in lockdown, uh, then they put in Manchester, I think they've now put Preston in. Um, this will also be Aberdeen, um, and I'm sure there are more to come. So you have to keep uh, updated with it. There's more obviously that came out last weekend about masks. Your client doesn't have a choice, they have to wear a mask. However, there are ways and means around it. We've seen the pillowcase over the hole. There's another way of dealing with a pillowcase where you actually put the base fit right through the hole if you have a cradle wrapped around the outside. Um, I haven't had any problem, clients have just done it um, without any, any uh, difficulty, but part of my uh, assumption with them and part of my assessment is what are you allergic to? So you know before they turn up what the problem is. Um, the temperature is, is interesting. We like people to take temperatures, it's a useful guideline, however you can't necessarily guarantee whether they're doing it. So we're all now using infrared no touch uh, temperature uh, gauges which will tell you exactly what they are. If their uh, temperature is high, you simply ask them to go home and contact their GP. You don't do anything else. We don't diagnose. But the hardcore about all of this is making sure you're safe, making sure your client is safe, and making sure that your clinic environment is safe. If for any reason, and we've already had test cases, something arises where somebody has been found to be uh, 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 symptomatic when they didn't know, asymptomatic, there are various regulations. We've had test and trace on the phone. If you wear full PPE, theoretically, if you test negative, you can go straight back to work. If you don't, you have to isolate for, for 14 days. That makes a huge difference to you, your business and your client base. So all of that is part of the thinking process. And the last thing that I'm going to add in is that we're now giving people advice on holidays. If people have been on holiday, how long before you can come to an appointment? If you yourself have been on holiday, how long before you go to an appointment? And you want to find out where they've been. Are they hot spots? How did they get there? If they flew, how many people on the plane were wearing masks? Usually less than half. If they came back by train, how many people were wearing masks? If they came back in a car and stopped off a petrol and motorway service station, ditto. It's a case of thinking of all the pros and cons of what you need to know to allow yourself to make an intelligent decision as to whether you're going to go ahead. And so the resource pack and the guidelines that we produce support everyone. Most importantly, they are guidelines and examples. They are not rules. There's no such thing as rules. 
but we are there as a resource for anybody to contact us to ask and we're being asked copious questions all the time however as a resource we are providing a support mechanism to thousands and thousands of massage therapists up and down the country okay thank you thank, thank you very much jenny cheers for that okay so hopefully um everybody's you know every business has done the risk assessment you've all done everything to keep your staff your customers safe that's just the first step isn't it because what we need to do is uh, think about how we counter customer fear so you may have seen various surveys out there between 30 40 percent of the public don't feel safe going into indoor premises it all varies depending on whether you're asking them about going to shops going to the pubs but essentially when they're going to an indoor environment um, there are about a third of people aren't feeling um, that confident. So uh, Caroline's already mentioned this is the government uh, A4 uh, blue notice that you can put up. This is essentially saying we've done everything right to keep us COVID secure. Um, but that is just, you know, that is just one thing that you can do. Um, think about this practically. Don't see this as a tick, as a tick box exercise. Um, you know, you have to do it because you're being asked to do it. So for example, this premise here, they've displayed it in their, on the premise window. Um, however, it's all hidden behind signage. So the chance of, this is a coffee shop, so the chance of somebody you know, walking past who's sitting on the fence, whether to go in, whether, to, whether, whether not to, will not see that sign. Even this premise who's clearly you know, trying to do their bit to get that information out there, you'll see, um, so to the left and right, you'll see the blue white notice. So they're putting it up in both places. However, it can easily get lost because you've got this huge green banner below. So I just want to kind of emphasize the point. You think about how you get across the message to your customers in, in the ways that you interact with them. So obviously at your premise, as much as possible, how do you get that across before people walk in? Because um, it's kind of too late when they're already inside your premise those people have already made the decision they're competent it's the ones that are walking past um obviously most people nowadays with many businesses they'll be booking so they won't get near your premise uh before they've made a decision whether to come so think about your websites your social media um have a prominent link on your home page uh which runs through the steps that you've done to keep staff and customers safe you can uh, think about putting your risk, you're publishing your risk assessment. I know it's a long and tedious document. Not many people may want to read it, but for those people who, some customers seeing the blue white notice will be enough. Others, you writing a few lines saying we've done this or done that to keep you safe, that'll 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 keep them happy. But then there'll be a small minority, might be five, might be ten percent of customers, who want something more to satisfy themselves that you have done a risk assessment and those are the people who will want to see that risk assessment and for those that do make it available because at that point when they see that 30 odd page document where you've thought through their safety each and every step of the way they're going to be left in no doubt that's a document that's unique unique to your premise um, it will leave them in no doubt that you have done what you need to to keep them safe when they visit. Um, think about, um, you may have to change your processes. Uh, I can't stress enough, please test them. Not just you as the person who's devised them. Try and get uh, customer staff who know nothing about a new process to walk through as if they're a client uh, to, to identify any, any areas that go wrong. And I give you this as an example. So restaurants have been told, you know, you need to do table service. Uh, limit interaction between staff and customers. So now in uh, hotel rooms, in um, pubs, outdoor and tables, you'll see QR codes and you go up to the code, pop your mobile on it, and it should direct you to the web page where you can order your food and drinks. However, I've visited pubs where the web page uh, that I'm directed to is unintelligible or um, it, you just could not find the menu. Um, three people in our table had to ask in, in different ways for assistance to find the information on, on, on the web page. So um, 
test test it out um, and also that's the same with the information you put online so i've seen restaurants uh you know four star international hotels they've put lots of information talking about the processes but it isn't covering everything uh for for example now we know ventilation is an issue these pages just talk about all the cleaning processes and how they clean surfaces down but no information about the ventilation system so people are coming in and this was like a restaurant that had a basement um seating there's no windows and doors that can open all they had is air conditioning units and there's no information on their covid staying safe page about the ventilation so not every customer will feel comfortable going up to staff and saying can you tell me about your air conditioning <laughs> Uh, and not all of them will be informed enough to write last questions. For many customers, they will come, they might not feel confident, they might stay for the treatment, but they may not be feel comfortable to come back. So this is why you need to really test out the information that you're providing and test out that customer experience. Um, think about, with that in mind, and, and do uh, bear in mind that the majority of people, uh, certainly I think it's a, a British thing, we don't like complaining. Um, most people don't complain, they just uh, take their complaints online. So you need to think about a way to incentivize customers to come back to you with their concerns. So that might be um, anonymous feedback. You may want to go further by providing, you know, the offer of a free treatment for any, uh, any feedback. I appreciate obviously after being uh, closed down for many months, you know, things are difficult financially, but if you get one decent good feedback from that one customer because of making that offer, that could really make a change in how many other customers uh, see you in terms of how safe uh, your, um, your premise is. Uh, do think about doing virtual tours. So um, there is a national chain of uh, gyms. that you have got a virtual tour that walks you through uh, one of their hundred gyms. However, the local gyms are now starting to do their own virtual tour video because they believe a customer doesn't want to know what one gym like, uh, you know, one gym in Scotland looks like. They want to know what, how, how will it look like if I visit my local gym from walking through the door, walking through the gym, etc. So think about that for your own, for your own um, premise. When customers approach the conversation that would take place, where they would be seated, where the massage would take place, and you can talk through that process. That will be a lot more powerful than simply um, a few paragraphs uh, in a page. Um, increase in prices uh, is bizarrely one of the things that might uh, give people the confidence. The reason being that these, you know, there is a cost attached to putting in place these safety measures. I've seen across various industries this 5% COVID-19 supplement. Um, some businesses have questioned, well, um, we don't feel comfortable putting our prices up. Uh, you know, it might scare some customers to your competitors. Uh, and the feeling is as long as you're clear why there's an increase, then customers will, uh, will understand. You know, everybody, everybody knows what's going on. People know that these uh, changes are not cheap, whether it's screens, PPE, new processes, there is a cost attached. So as long as you communicate that in the right way, it should be fine. Um, in terms of how much you charge, that's down to you, but 5% tends to be uh, the common figure that I'm seeing. When you're thinking of, about making a decision, do I buy safety measure X, which is more expensive and more effective versus Y, which is cheaper, but I know to be less effective, be mindful, this is long term. Nobody knows when it's going to end. We've heard a variety of claims from scientists saying it might be two waves, six waves. Um, most seem to be saying it's, you know, it's around it till at least uh, past summer next year, uh, 2021. So um, be mindful that this is not going to be a short thing. Whatever you're buying in terms of equipment safety processes is something that you will use for many months. And also be mindful of the context of the world we now live in. It, it is a globalized, more connected world. We've seen just in the last 10 years an increase in pandemics that have visited the UK. Um, and the, the, you know, the health experts tell us 
more pandemics are a likely occurrence in the future because of this more global connected world. There is a range of financial support from government. Uh, so again, there's so much information out there, but this link uh, is a really good place to start. You just answer a few questions and it will tell you the grants, loans, advice relevant to you and your sector. There is also new free government recovery advice, so more practical uh, advice and assistance, for example, information around accounting, HR, legal affairs. Um, and then there is marketing advice, uh, which your trade association guides may cover. Uh, so I've seen that in, in various ways. So those will talk about some of the things I've talked about in terms of virtual tours, in terms of uh, how you, the kind of information you put out there on your social media networks. Um, so one of my uh, areas of uh, expertise and interest is e-commerce. Um, and so just a little bit of insight. Most uh, consumers uh, are attracted to social media because they like in terms of businesses, business accounts, because they like to get a bit of a, an insight into the business. Cust customers on social media aren't just interested in getting the business information, promotional material. They like to know a little bit about who's behind the business, where you came from. So think about that in terms of what's been going on the last three months. Um, you know, some of you have just uh, are opening up or just in the last month. You can talk about the story of what's been going on with your business and, and bring that into the story about the changes that you've had to implement, uh, which gets you onto the safety measures of how you're making uh, the place safe for your customers. Um, safeguarding your sector, obviously nobody wants, uh, you know, another second wave of sector closures in your industry. We, we don't want to see more local lockdowns. There's two things um, that you can do in, uh, yourself to help avoid that. One is become COVID secure yourself. Two, report those in your industry who are failing to implement uh, these safety measures. There is an HSC helpline, which is national, or you can contact your local authorities environment health team. Um, I would just put your mind at rest. You know, if you're thinking, I don't want to report, uh, you know, this uh, uh, competitor because you, you fear that uh, formal action fines will follow. The regulators take an advice approach, not just us, but it's the same that I'm hearing when I'm on webinars with other regulators and police authorities. Government and regulators are 110% behind businesses. Um, we will take an advice focused approach only where a business clearly isn't following advice. We are then thinking about uh, enforcement. So we've been doing this for months. We were getting reports of, for example, barbers being open when they were, should have been closed. We didn't just go in there with fines and enforcement. We had conversations with them, then formal letters um, um, to, uh, to get uh, those changes in place. So please do make those reports. You work in this industry, you're likely to be more aware of this than us. We obviously can't get around every premise um, in, in the UK. So we're, we're relying on industry to uh, as, uh, some of our eyes and ears to help protect your industry um, from second closures. And, and that's it from uh, the speaker. So I'm, I'm now going to open it up to Q&A. We had, uh, I'm going to give you the option. You should be able to unmute yourself at your end if you have a question. So at the moment, everybody's muted, but if you have a question, you can unmute yourself. There were also uh, some questions in the chat. So just while you're thinking about your questions for any of the, uh, any of the four speakers, um, I'll just uh, summarize the answers um, that I gave to previous questions. So we're, one question was whether the slides are going to be circulated, um, a recording of the webinar, and a list um, of the various reference materials. So I've met, there's been a lot of information thrown at you in terms of studies regarding efficacy of face coverings or virus transmission and aerosols. There'll be a summary of that information in the studies. So if you want to get into the detail, you'll have the option to do that. That will be circulated to your trade associations um, who will then get out to members. I expect that we'll probably be able to, we need to edit the webinar uh, slightly at our end, so maybe end of next week, 
roughly speaking, is when I think we could get that information out. And um, question about recording, which I've just answered. Um, one question, I've seen advice to wear goggles instead of a visor in this hot weather. So the, the visor is, um, you know, the visor offers additional protection in terms of eyes. So when somebody sneezes or coughs, those droplets can, you know, as well as be breathed in, they can uh, go into your eyes. And it is known that there is a risk uh, of droplets landing on the, um, the eyes and that have been one way that you could transmit. Um, although they, it's, it's thought that that's less likely than the risk of breathing it in. So that is why you may have seen some advice that goggles uh, could be as uh, you know, an alternative to visors in the hot weather. Does any, anybody else have an alternative uh, view on that? Oh, that's obviously you're wearing your face covering. So you're wearing yeah, your as long as you're wearing a face covering that's covering your mouth and nose, definitely. Yeah, yeah that, that could be an option. Again, it's just, as you mentioned, it's just protection for the eyes. So, yeah. And obviously, and remember to clean and sanitise in between use, obviously. That's really important. And I'm aware, aware there's some concerns with some visors because they fog up. Um, you can use anti-fogging spray that di scuba divers use. But there is actually, there is visors out there sold as um, anti-fogging. Again, unfortunately, there's a lot of scams. So with any of these uh, equipment that you're purchasing, look towards reputable businesses that have been around, you know, for, for years, uh, rather than some businesses just set up in recent months. You will see a lot out there online of uh, companies, uh, very fancy websites, selling things slightly cheaper than the rest, and it's because it isn't up to scratch, it isn't tested, it is misdescribed. Um, so go to the reputable businesses for purchasing uh, PPE. Any other questions, you can mention it in the chat or, uh, or, or just unmute yourself. So that's the bottom left of your screen and you can uh, ask the question. And, it, and also if any of the speakers have any uh, additional uh, last points that they'd like to raise, uh, by all means, whilst we're waiting for questions. Not only that, everything's changing all the time. So obviously, just keep an eye on government changes because I'm I'm keeping up as much as everyone else. <laughs> That's same for us. You know, we we put everything live on our website as soon as we get clarification from the government. Okay, so uh, question around ventilation: whether when the weather becomes cold uh, and you know you can't just keep all the windows and doors open, is there any other advice other than having the heating on very high? So I mentioned indoor heating can lower the humidity uh, and then that means that more of the large droplets change to these tiny aerosols that float around. I, I, I don't have any um, alternative to keeping windows and doors open, even if, um, sorry, this is colder days. So as a, when the weather becomes cold, so you don't want to open the windows and doors because it will have to make the room cold. I, I still think, you know, you can have the heating on to warm up the room, but still have uh, windows open to allow a breeze in. Whatever you're doing, you're trying to encourage a fresh breeze of air. So you might have air conditioning. If you haven't, you're then using fans. Uh, obviously, just open windows and doors in itself doesn't bring fresh air in, uh, you know, and, Sometimes there is no wind, there is no breeze. So you need to encourage it and you do that by using fans. So um, look towards the guidance that um, it's going to be shared. These 15 recommendations that come out from the heating and air conditioning um, European Trade Association. I think that's going to be the best place for the most up-to-date advice. They, that guide has been updated three times in the last two odd months. So they're very... Uh, you know, they're on the ball, and I, I fully expect that uh, as warmer climates come, they will be updating the advice. That said, that is a European organization, so some countries already have uh, different uh, temperatures. Mm -hmm. and, and so look to that guidance um, for your, you know, the most comprehensive advice. 
Uh, and also okay. maybe just um, increase the time between clients. If you need to do a complete flush out between clients and then sort of shut the window a little bit more, obviously we're encouraging ventilation, but you've got to be, it's got to be comfortable to have a massage too. You don't want the person freezing. So yeah, look to have a, a, a longer time between clients just to, to be able to ventilate and, and clear out the room. Yes, that's a good point. Cause I was thinking in terms of the, the kind of reception era, but yeah, no, the, this is why um, the advice is around keeping um, spaces between clients, because obviously when somebody is, uh, you know, unclothed, um, you can't just open all the windows um, fully. So um, Jenny was mentioning, you know, there's no, unfortunately, there's no clear guidance on how long should a treatment be, how long should the time be in between. And, and the reason for this is the science is constantly evolving. We have no hard black and white answers at the moment. All we have is the best information that is out there internationally in, in, in this various studies that have been done. You will see in the close contact guidance, it did talk about trying to keep treatments down to one hour. So it gave us an example, if somebody came for 40 minute, uh, you know, hair treatment, and then they asked for a 30, 40 minute massage, you would have to tell them to book that to come back another day. And that was because we, what we do know is the longer that you are around and near somebody that might have the virus, and bear in mind, most people will not know they have it, they're not displaying symptoms. So the longer you're around those people in close proximity, the higher the risk. Why is that? Because it's the more that you're breathing in the particles that the virus carrier is breathing out, the more likely it is that it will overwhelm your immune system. Okay, now this is why face coverings are so important because we've seen, you know, face coverings. Some of these homemade face coverings were blocking 80 to 95 percent of particles from being released from the covering. So, even though you might be around, so there's a huge difference between two people being in a, a, in, a, in a room, uh, poorly ventilated room without face coverings as opposed to, to both of them wearing a face covering where as little as five to 10% of those virus particles might be released in the air. It would obviously take a lot longer um, to be around that virus carrier wearing a covering for you to pick up enough particles, breathe it in enough for you to be then, uh, to, to pick up the virus. Paul, well, we are advising a minimum of half an hour between clients which gives the opportunity to clean everything if you're dealing with hallways, doors, bathrooms, toilets, taps, massage tables, flooring, um, in particular because things like the sprays and the wipes take between 15 and 20 minutes to dry. So you can't actually get people in any quicker than that. And it gives you plenty of opportunity to ventilate as well whilst you're doing it. Yes, thanks. So that is, that is the guidance from your association. Um, you will see, I've seen uh, some uh, hairdresser, hairdresser salons, book their clients in such a way that they'll have, say they've got room for three, four people to safely socially distance in the room. And they'll book those people in for that one hour. They've all got different treatments. And then they'll have that 15, 20 minute space to ventilate the air, the air before they bring in the next three, four clients. So that is, um, you know, it's not just obviously people do massage therapy. You need to think about in your premise, the way you work. This is why it's so important to do advanced bookings and to give you the time to do the cleaning, but also to ventilate that space that people will be waiting in or um, to be uh, sitting in during the treatment. Um, as much as possible, you're trying to limit waiting inside. So part of the advice that you're going to give out, which I think I've seen in, in, in the NHS uh, BF guidance is around encouraging them not to come and wait as much as possible. You'll have asked all your questions, pinned down what they need. So literally, as soon as they're walking in there, you know, it's only five or so minutes before their appointment time to minimize how long they're in that premise. And that's what you need to think about in all your interactions uh, between staff and customers and between staff. How do you minimize um, the contact that you have um, where you're operating in, a, in an area that's not uh, well ventilated. I've mentioned that ventilation is, you know, one of the mitigation uh, uh, factors that could be considered. Uh, so when you're thinking about 
people waiting, if it's if people have to wait around, obviously in between treatments, uh, they may have to wait. Just bear in mind where they're waiting. Uh, some hair salons, for example, have opened up um, un previously unused areas and just made it a waiting area where they can ventilate that room much more than they can in their usual uh, salon space. So you have to think about what works for you and your premise. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Any last minute questions? There's a question there about someone asking about uh, Air training. purifiers. Okay. No, training. Elaine. Oh, yeah. Okay. yeah. I can answer that. Yes, um, great. At the moment, we are in the process of getting our uh, massage schools and establishments back to work. As you're probably aware, there are two types of training, one of which is the uh, uh, marketing and the uh, uh, body work. Uh, training which is everything to do with uh, muscles, bones, etc. The APMP, they can be done off online on Zoom in laid out sections, including the exams that go with that. However, the big problem we have is the actual body work, the actual physical touch work, which has to be done depending on whether you're wanting to do levels one, two and three with iTech or levels four, five and six with organizations like mine. They all have a minimum requirement for physical hands on touch. What we're actually working on at the moment is how we can achieve that, how we can actually get our school environments laid out ready with all of the things that we've been talking about for yourself, your cleansing, the environment to get in and train, how you're going to train, how you're going to do your training with guest clients, how that's going to work and so on. And then how we're going to manage that in terms of the assessments. It's not easy. I actually curiously right now I'm in the middle of writing the school's version of the resource pack which will be out next week. So keep your eye on the GCMT website and that information will be there. Um, I'll send you a private message if you want to talk about it. I'll give you my mobile and you can ring. Um, but it's in progress is the only thing that I can say at the moment. I can't see that anyone's going to be starting any new courses until next year, until we've got all of this in place. Right, thank you. Uh, and any, has any research been done on air purifiers? So uh, obviously you've got HEPA purifying uh, or as in air conditioning units. Those vary between 85 to 99.9% uh, effectiveness at uh, filtering particles that are um, as small as uh, virus particles. And there is guidance in the, the, H, the HVAC trade association guidance uh, in terms of things to think about if you have got HEPA filters in terms of servicing, etc. Um, if you're talking about these kind of smaller air purifiers that you can just, you know, little kind of tabletop ones, um, the I'm not aware of a kind of comprehensive study, um, but the information that I was able to glean uh, when I was researching this was that air purifiers tend to only work um, in a small area, uh, so. I think, and I'll, this will be covered in the follow-up, I think it was saying, and obviously it will vary depending on which air purifier you use, they're all different levels of uh, strength, but any, it can't uh, benefit anything more than a 10 meter squared room, uh, so it's really because they're, they're not powerful enough. So it might be something that's helpful to have near uh, where the clients are, and it's purifying the area just beside there, but it's not going to purify the air in a whole room. Um, and I, I think that is uh, it for the question. So we're going to um, stop there. Uh, I want to thank our speakers. Thank you very much, Caroline, Maria, and Jenny. Thank you. It's been really You're helpful welcome. having you on the call. Um, and thank you for everybody that joined. Um, I think I already mentioned the webinars. Yes, we're going to be doing the recordings and follow-up information will be sent around. So just keep your eyes on your uh, on the GCMT page and also the the NHBF uh, pages. All right, thanks very much. Thanks, bye. Bye-bye.